Welcome everybody to a brand new episode of the Jabs T podcast where August Cat's ass is just right there and we're going to be talking about two brand new records this week like we do normally because we haven't had a normal episode in about of a month and it seems that we are a little bit out of sorts today but that's okay it just makes it more unhinged more unpredictable we're coming at you with some new exciting maverick content we're going to be talking about new project from Nicholas Jar and uh, who the fuck else? Nicholas Harrington. That one. Yeah, Dark Side. We're going to be talking about Spiral, the much anticipated follow up to their album Psychic. And we're going to Saw be talking about the Final Chapter. Oh, no not Chris Rock. We're also going to be talking about the album from the front man of the band, Doubters. We're going to be talking about Alexis Marshall's House of Lull, Null, House of When. It's got like a space and a period. Fucking n- name your fucking album something normal. For fuck's sake, Alexis. House of Lull, House of When. House of Ween. <laughs> yeah. House of Wax funny because it's like a penis and a band hello darkness my old friend but before we get into the episode today we have a couple of things to shout out as well obviously we're pumping out content but the most important thing we want to shout out because it's not on this channel is that august has come back and pummeled us with a new video august why don't you do a little plug for your latest creation so my latest video is an analysis on the uh, Super Sentai series, uh, Chojin Sentai Jetman. It's a long video where I'm breaking down the, the plot, the characters, the villains, basically everything I make that, that I think makes the show worth your time, worth watching. If you're into tokusatsu, Super Sentai, Kamen Rider, anything like Power Rangers even, uh, it's a video I think will have something for you. There's a lot of, uh, lot of, and I think it's also a video I'm, I'm really proud of myself with because A, I edited the whole thing in like a day or two and B, it's a huge step up just in terms of the editing and uh, script writing from the Elfin Lead video before. But uh, it, it's one I'm very proud of and I, uh, I hope it's something you will want to check out even if it's not necessarily in your lane yeah the work shows considerably in my opinion it is a fantastic video it might be like on the longer side but it is like it doesn't feel that way at all frankly and for somebody who had no fucking clue as to what you were going on about just because i'm so oblivious to the world of sentai you actually got me interested in it so i mean fucking literally just mission accomplished um yeah so, so yeah please go check that out that's going to be linked in the description we'll yeah. absolutely do that and make sure um, you go and subscribe to august as well um, yes please very do that he has several deserving. past videos that are also worth watching and mm-hmm. i guess this is sort of uh technically a it's foregone uh announcement but it'll it's kind of time traveling because it's not here yet but it will be by the time this is shown but uh my book series is done children of the gray volume nine is out and that is the last fucking one i will be putting up the omnibus within the next week sarah actually has the first one there uh but yeah this is the second one the entire second arc is complete now oh my god i've been writing for 11 months I didn't ah! know that. that's incredible and now you may sleep please um, uh yeah so lots happening uh we've obviously put out if you are one of our viewers who really only sticks around for the new release reviews i don't know if there are any viewers that do that but we have actually put out a lot of videos since our last set of new release reviews obviously our radiohead retrospective is continuing uh our how to the thief video is our most recent um, music video music review video so go and check that out Also did great record club videos on Broken Social Scene and Porcupine Tree this week that are well worth your time as well. And we'll be having more um, coming in the next few days 
also. So yeah, stick around for all of that stuff. Including August's recommended album this week, which is at the drive-ins relationship of commands. So that's a big one. You might yes. want to stay tuned for that. Post hardcore classic that'll be hitting on Tuesday. So uh-huh. yes. Uh-huh. And the sequel to my last record club. Indeed. It's the red dozen days. So those of you who, Sorry. if there are any of you out there who keep close tabs on the videos that we put out, then, you know, we do care about, yeah. you know, continuity and, and telling a story and stuff. So, yeah, you'll be pleasantly surprised, I think. Anyway, what we've been listening to over the past three weeks, I guess, like everyone just keep you to your normal five max, but you can draw, I guess, from the past three weeks of music since we haven't really done this in a while. But Jake, what have you been listening to recently? Well, uh, I guess just to, uh, again, tie in the content that we're making is that uh, I, I've listened to a lot of music in the last three weeks, um, a, a considerable amount. It just so happens that 50% of my listening time has been devoted to In Rainbows, uh, which I have listened to like once a day for the past two weeks. I'm a little, I'm a little unhinged. But so, yeah, uh, been, been preparing for that, I suppose. Just, just had that on constantly, just always, always on. Tom York, always watching. But outside of uh, stuff that just, you know, more casual stuff, I've been listening to uh, a little bit more of one Miss Kate Bush. Uh, I checked out The Sensual World a couple of weeks ago and was just like, damn, I think I might like this as much as Hounds of Love. And then, man, I listened to it again and was like, damn, I think I might like this a little bit more than hounds of love that's just a just a all killer record like every single song on that album is mind-blowing each like that that sort of run of album she has of like you know dreaming hounds of love and then that album or just like you can just tell that at like the central world it's just like yeah this sounds like an album from somebody who just made hounds of love and just self-produced the dreaming because everything is just so fucking ornate and and beautiful and purposeful and it's all it's just some of the best of not only her work but just in the genre in general if you're you know if you're even vaguely interested in music like that that is an essential listen an album that i simply do not hear talked about as much as i should frankly uh, for how good it is Uh, another album i checked out is uh (laughs) real ones who have been watching a the episodes for like a couple of months now might remember that we reviewed the new album by death from above 1979 and uh we didn't uh we didn't particularly care for that nobody was a i don't no, no I don't nobody was a that. fan yeah um it wasn't a, it wasn't a new 1979 and it, album what 19 i almost said 1975 good job oh let's not combine those two things um but yeah, we reviewed that new album. And before that, I'd only heard uh, You're a Woman, I'm a Machine, which is a terrific record. Uh, but uh, I finally moved past it and I listened to their uh, album, Outrages Now. Uh, and Outrages Now is great. Uh, I, I'd say I'd even like it as much as I like You're a Woman, I'm a Machine. It's a little bit more, uh, you know, You're a Woman is a really like fundamentals album. It's just kind of like it goes, it's got one mode. It's constantly in that mode and it never stops. And it's like the perfect length to explore that particular thing. And it's irreverent and cool. And Outrages Now is a little bit more emotional. It's a little bit more like, again, you know, it's like a very simple act they've got going on, but there's a little bit more instrumental variety and stuff. Uh, And there's a lot more emphasis on melody, I think, when it comes to the writing and uh, the vocals. And I'm just a really big fan of that. It has songs on there like Freeze Me, which are just some of the best songs the band has has cranked out that I've heard of so far. Uh, I I enjoy that album uh, a great deal. It's, It's quite good. Uh, I re-listened to an, an, a classic record, a uh, record that I haven't heard nearly as much as I should have, considering how much I love the band. Uh, but I listened to The Cure's Pornography for the third time in total, first time in like a year and a half. And good gosh golly, that album is like fucking, what, nine songs long, and every single one of them is like goddamned perfect. Uh, that is just like, it's, it's just unhinged. It's It's such a wild, frantic manic frankly terrifying at points album and it's so like influential on the darker sides of the sounds that the cure explored like gothic rock and just sort of post-punk it's just like you know you, you have artists today like chelsea wolf and lingua ignata and they like it's like that that album's like ground zero for their entire aesthetic and it's 
fucking amazing. Uh, best album, best Cure album opener, I think, with 100 years. I, I, I can't, like, that song is stuck in my head on a loop. I, I can't not hear that. It's fucking, it is freaking, I feel like my head's on fire. Love it. It's cool. Sorry, what do you, what do you hear again? I'm not going to do that again. Because everyone has been, you know, hotly anticipating the <laughs> release of the new Kanye West album, the new Kanye West album, uh, which I'm sure will come on, uh, come in early August. Sure. The, the Kanye West incident, the Kanye West <laughs> annual jamboree. Jamboree. <laughs> um, but I did listen some to. My my favorite Kanye West project, uh, the day before Donda dropped, just because you know there's a lot of talk about Kanye, and I just kind of like to detach myself from the discourse. But I'm just like, you know, I might as well listen to some of the stuff because it's like it's so easy to forget that I just you know like a lot of that man's music. And so I listened to Late Registration, and Late Registration bumps still, in my opinion, pretty confidently his his best album. Uh, like it's front to back it's just song that does not miss after song that does not miss he manages to make Adam Levine tolerable on a song which is a feat that has not been accomplished since so that's certainly something I would wager but it also has songs that are just like you know songs I never hear talked about like Drive Slow which is just like fucking ah uh, it's so fucking good uh, Tyler has needs more Caucasian mode <laughs> <laughs> yep. Crack music fella. <laughs> that real black music fella. Who was on the moon, Tyler? <laughs> Tyler <laughs> watch, and watch Jam to T. Great music quiz. Watch that. Uh, 21 I, edition. Yeah. Uh, and I, I certainly did listen to a hell of a lot, hell of a lot of strapping young lad, hell of a lot of Opeth, hell of a lot of the Dillinger escape plan. But the last thing I will shout out is uh, a newer listen is I will listen with the announcement of the new uh, war on drugs album. I listened to lost in the dream uh, because uh, a deeper understanding has quickly climbed its way up to being one of my favorite albums in the whole widest world, like top 15. I, I, Ooh, that's a, hmm, that might be a record club one day because good gosh, golly, there's a, there's a lot there. Um, but I listened to Lost in the Dream, which I, I like a good deal. That is a very good album. Uh, and unfortunately, I am in the awful precarious position of only being able to compare it to a deeper understanding, which I mean, like, is not fair on Lost in the Dream. Lost in the Dream is a little bit more meditative. It's not as like, forward and i won't say it's like aggressive but like there's just points on a deeper understanding that are just like blisteringly like euphoric and the lost in the dream doesn't really like focus on that it does like a little bit more of like the atmosphere building which it's pretty good at oh. i just think it's overall a slightly less consistent record like a little oh. tiny itty bitty bit I'll take a second to ride for it just because Jake and I have kind of like completely different contexts for the war on drugs music. Cause Jake's going to come to it fairly recently. I was getting into it, um, you know, during the lead up to lost in the dream. Uh, and I remember when like the, the fucking music world lost its shit when red eyes came out, that was the first single for that record. And you know, you're right that lost in the dream is a kind of more low key record overall than deeper understanding. And I definitely prefer deeper understanding as well. Don't get me wrong, but that, Lost in the Dream still has bangers and Red Eyes totally. is one of those, just one of the band's best songs. Uh, I love that shit. Ocean Between the Waves, Burning, oh. fucking, yeah. Burning. Amazing yes. song. Uh, yeah, I, I just, totally a worthwhile record. Don't let my, like, it sounds mild. Like I gave the album like an eight. It's a great yeah. album. Don't misunderstand me. It's kind of just a record that has slightly different appeal like it's it's for yeah. a slightly different mindset like when you're really like just in your fucking zoning out at like 3 a.m there's very little better than that record but when you want to like get in the car and just kind of like you know create like in big lebowski hitting this hitting the fucking roof of the car uh -huh. and just fucking booming then you want to throw on deeper understanding yeah deeper understanding has got that kind of anthemic like at least when it gets to like those euphoric highs that i talked about it has the same appeal as something like a poppier springsteen cut except if it was like produced with like neo psych and it's what a fucking awesome the relationship between those two records honestly reminds me of the relationship between 
um, Laser Guided Melodies and Ladies and Gentlemen, We're Floating in Space Ooh. by Spiritual. Yeah, that's the great term. Like, right? Laser Guided also Melodies just... is the fucking lost in the dream. It is more has more of those kind of ambient textures. It, it focuses more on the mood and the tone. Um, and it's very rich in terms of those things. And then ladies and gentlemen has all that, but then it has these kind of ornate, huge songs that are imposed on top of it that make it feel larger than life um, and like the fullest realization of it. So yeah, the relationship is the same. And I love both of those records. Uh, obviously I prefer ladies and gentlemen, just like I prefer a deeper understanding, but I value the satisfaction that a record like laser guided melodies and a record like lost in the dream gives me when i'm looking for that hungry for that kind of thing so yeah it's just different strokes i i, I also listen to this because it finally came in the mail <laughs> sexy i'm happy about it i'm really happy about that one of the things i listened to was uh the new harsh noise uh collaborative project from shushu and black leather jesus i i don't know why i listen to this mainly on, mainly on the basis of the name black leather jesus was interesting enough of a prospect and you know it's a harsh noise album you you get what's on the tin i thought it was at least of what i've heard of the genre i thought it was fairly evocative i thought it, it worked nice enough but also not something where I ever feel I'm going to rush back to listen to it ever again. So kind of just falls on the eh side of things. What doesn't, though, is uh, Queens of the Stone Age like clockwork. This is uh, it's pretty good kind of alternative rock type album. A lot of uh, I really did care for the uh, shoegazy uh influences on this that it, it, it really does not sound like what i would expect the people in caius to make yeah or right least, i mean you got yeah. a lot of um a lot has happened in between the caius years <laughs> and the time you get to that record in fairness yeah Hell, I mean, sometimes no. it even doesn't sound like an album that queens of the stone age would make <laughs> just so much acid <laughs> yeah. I, I definitely think that obviously the aesthetic of a record like um you know songs for the deaf is just one of those albums you have to hear but i think the aesthetic of a record like lullabies to paralyze will really appeal to you as well august both oh. very very different records to like clockwork yeah no i mean i i want to dig deeper into their kind of sound and stuff especially since as my dad pitched it to me this is like unlike anything else they've done in a sense yeah. but yeah it's a very uh, refreshing album yeah them, august but... gonna ride for era vulgaris i can feel it <laughs> possibly i don't honestly now, have no idea now on to the uh actually no one one more thing i i enjoyed that being uh live through this by uh the band whole courtney loves band i i i did uh i it is something where there are certain tracks where if I think too much about the lyrical content, I'm going to want to shoot my head off. But in general, <laughs> I did. Thanks, Courtney. Yeah, I, I did generally enjoy this. I thought it actually, I thought there was a good uh, tunefulness and uh, almost pop sensibility to some of the grungier aspects. I think she brings a, a nice amount of uh, genuine ferocity and anger to an album that comes very close off of the heels of uh, Kurt's death, although obviously not uh, that not being a part of the recording process but uh, no he died famously i think four or five days before that album came out yeah yeah and it's it's yeah. heavily heavily suggested that he wrote a lot of it <laughs> which i think is kind of unfair but also like i can understand why that suggestion exists well, there's probably a kernel of truth to it, although that is that is certainly a Courtney Love album, and I don't think you could possibly take that away from her. No, yeah. Uh, no matter as hard as Olivia Rodrigo tries. <laughs> yeah. Topical jokes! Wow. 
But yeah, it wasn't bad. I thought it was all right. Last thing, and the worst thing, was uh, from One O Tricks Point Never, one of his earlier albums. Uh, he named it under some stupid thing. Okay. So I, I'm going to look at Daniel look up what, the third. Thank you. Uh, Total System Point Never, this collaboration was called with another artist called Total System Failure. It's this kind of free jazz, dark ambient fusion thing where neither idea is executed particularly well or beyond like the most generic boilerplate version of the genre you could possibly think of. So it just becomes a huge waste of time and completely inessential. So not recommend. And it's everything. I love it when August tells me about an album I've never heard of and then tells me to never listen to it. <laughs> it I mean, it's, it's a, it, he both enriches my knowledge of the musical world and saves me time. Yeah. Yes, good. Can't lose. Frankly. I do want to listen to more early um, OPN, though. I, I feel like there's uh, got to be some good gems. You, you should area. listen to betrayed in the octagon if you want like really early yeah. low 10 because that's the best thing of those that early like tape cassette era sick i will definitely Lo love check that, that out Mars album. i listened to two classic neil young albums those being after the gold rush and harvest and the man invented songwriting it's crazy is 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 a it's like when they discovered fire, uh, <laughs> except nobody changed Neil Young to a rock and had birds peck his eyes out until the end of time, which again, ah. thank you. Spurred on by the most recent Gang of Youths EP and their cover of the title track, I listened to Elbows Asleep in the Back, which was real good. Not quite as consistent as I was kind of hoping it would be, especially based on the title track itself which is like seldom seen kid oh, yes like yes that album. listen to that record that record fucking rules very different album to asleep in the back yeah okay uh yeah very good very solid indie with dream pop dalliances uh i also listened to bierk's post D dees pretty good record pretty all right invented um, production yeah she called it post because pretty... it delivers <laughs> that that was pretty good well done i had to like it took me a moment to be like wait is that embarrassing i'm i'm like, <laughs> then i realized I'm so, it wasn't <laughs> i'm so twitter brained that i'm trying to think of like a twitter posting thing and you just went straight to the Post. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm like the Joker at the end of Arkham City. It's just dying and just like that, it's actually pretty funny. <laughs> Your Mark Hamill Joker impersonation is pretty good. I can't do it for more than five seconds. Uh, yeah, it's a hyper ballad. Good. Uh huh. Army so so me. quiet. I go through Snaps. the list. <laughs> that was me. Uh, it was me impersonating the guy from Shushu impersonating Bjork. <laughs> and the last thing or things I will talk about is the let's count one, two, three, four. Yeah, I listened to four REM albums this week. Oh, damn. Uh, just going in order at this point. Uh, Murmur, Reckoning, fucking. Fables of the Reconstruction? Yes. Yes. Oh, you were just yes. doing a thing. Sorry, I'm yes. Uh, yes, Fables of the Reconstruction. Don't like nearly as much as those, but it is very solid. Uh, it's an, It was an interesting turn for them to take at that point in their career. Because, uh, you know, you can't do Reckoning again because it'll just be worse. Uh, Life's Rich Pageant. Also heavily enjoyed that. Starting to see where they... Uh, they become the what's the frequency Kenneth REM as opposed to the Radio Free Europe REM, which mm. is it's you know pretty 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 based 
as the kids say. A lot of heated discussion among REM fans about the best album of that era. I, I've like basically gone, had basically all of them at number one at some point. And currently it's Reckoning, but it could be any of those at any point. Yeah. Learned the other day that Tom York's favorite REM song is So Central Rain, which it's as a huh. dope paste. Like, Based. yeah. If any, if your favorite REM song is any track from Reckoning, then you're automatically a fucking just king. Yeah. You're just automatically fucking dope. Mine, mine's Night Swimming, which, well, that's just is also, is also have, dope. That's just, you know, no one can argue with that. No, and if they try, I will behead them. So I've had a pretty good week for listening to like heavy shit. I listened to Strapping Young Lads, Alien, which <laughs> my fucking teeth on the floor. Yes. Came and stole my lunch money. Um, and this is in a triple bill with um, In Absentia, which I've already talked about at length on the podcast, as we all have. Um, and Epicus Dumicus Metallicus. All of us. Which, mm. Yes. Which, if there is ever an album that lived up to the name it gave itself, it, it, it is that one. I think I'm the only one now who hasn't heard that. I need to really change that. Yeah, you probably should. I mean, it's interesting that my, like, journey into doom metal was via, like, funeral doom metal. So everything that I've heard sort of since then is... Very different from, from what I expect of the genre. In a way, I you really like. started with the single least uh, accessible facet of that genre. <laughs> so now everything probably so like you throw on this album, it's just like oh shit, this is like their pop album, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, um, the playing is amazing. Uh, the vocals are great. Um, it's a very it's a much more instrumentally varied album than I expected. And, you know, I liked it very much. Um, and Solitude is just one of the best album openers of all fucking time. Uh, yeah. But then the next track is, I would say, better. Demon's Gate. Yeah, Demon's Gate, yeah. I just love the intro to that album, to that song, sorry. Um, it's great. Yeah, but um, I've been listening to a podcast series about the Black Death, and one of the members said that uh, the Ghost album prequel is sort of about that um and so i listened to yeah. that fucking rules it's so much fun i knew uh, you would like I, that one very glad you, you did you did uh and i just ugh, so many amazing hooks Rats, bah, oh. bah, bah, bah. I, I like how he puts the stink on it. it's like billy cord and fucking early <laughs> smashing pumpkins when he's just like What's the song? Of, oh, yeah, it's fucking uh, uh, Bullet with Butterfly Wings, where he just kind of has that, like, stank on that Spying delivery, and you're just like, mm, yeah. I'm still just a rat in a cage. But, um, sorry, what else have I listened to this week? Uh, obligatory folk punk mention. I listened to the first Billy Bragg... There we go. I listened to the first Billy Bragg record, Life So Right with Spy vs. Spy. Um, he is someone who, if you are a British leftist who likes folk music, you will know him. Uh, but I actually got into him by listening to a cover, uh, not a cover, like a reinterpretation that he did of the song Walk Away Renee, um, which is just, it's an absolutely heartbreaking version. But uh, Life's Right with Spy vs. Spy, very stripped back, doesn't always work because it, it, it's very, um, mm. uh, it's very amateur in a way at points, but it has some great songs and some great hooks. And if you're interested in this scene, it's a must listen and to cap it all off i listened to an album called find me a drink home by cheap girls which has if you'll give me a, a hot minute 65 ratings including mine on rate your music um, ouch but um the artwork was done by jeff rosenstock and it's it's a really fun like power fuzzy pop punk thing i had a great time with it and i would i would recommend it it's called find me a drink home it is by a band called cheap girls so things i have been listening to that i want to shout out i listened to the second ko dot album continuing my dive into the music Ooh. of ko dot called dowsing anemone with copper tongue uh really enjoyed this record it's not quite at the stratospheric levels of choirs of the eye or the Mortal of the well records but it's denser and weirder and more 
um, it really leans into the avant-garde side of their sound at certain points, but I really enjoyed it. Uh, I listened to Freak Out by the Mothers of Invention. Finally, yeah. finally digging into the world of, of Frank Zappa. Well, world of the mothers. Zap, because I have, Zappa pillification. I have heard um, Hot Rats, but I want to dig into the mothers records, especially since August has been talking about them so frequently. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed Freak Out. I think it's um, obviously as viewers of our music quiz will know it is the one of the first if not the first example of a rock double album and it certainly is a, a a lot of music it's a lot to take in i think it's very front loaded i'm not a big fan of the jammier stuff in the second half of the record um i think some of it's a bit too ponderous but the there's a lot of really great like for especially for 1966 like really just incredible songs that are very kind of elementally simple but um also wickedly funny and just very charming in a way I wasn't expecting actually. Um, so yeah, I really dug that. I also want to shout out, uh, I listened to the Venetian Snares album, Doll, 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 which is uh, a, a sort of mixture of breakcore and noise music record oriented around the concept of child murderers. And it is a very intense album uh it's very loud it's very in your face um it definitely leans more into murderers who are children or children that are murdered children that are murdered okay um, I, I was like that could be very different things depending on how that's worded none yeah. of them are good yeah like, it's a very obviously, no like I, I feel like if you didn't know that you wouldn't pick that up just listening to it it's certainly a bit of context that i happen to know in advance that informed my experience although there is a track on the album called befriend a child killer which uh you know does that's hint at it and there are multiple moments on the record where it's supposedly rumored that he uses spoken word samples from actual tapes of children being murdered but i think that is a bit of an urban legend i think it's probably that 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 stuff is probably sourced where does, elsewhere where does one acquire such a thing i mean considering this that's record was made point. in 2001 as well i would be very curious oh napster okay yeah, Napster. But anyway, <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, it definitely leans more into the break core slash drum and bass side of things than the noise music side of things. So it's not too unfriendly. Um, but there is a track on here. I forget what it's called. Let me just get it up. There's a particular track on here that stood out to me called Pressure Torture. That is, and I don't, I say this fully aware of how hyperbolic it is, the most intense piece of music I've ever heard in my life. It is absolutely ear splitting so if you have any attraction to wanting to experience the extremes of how music can sound just to experience them i would highly recommend listening to the venetian snares track pressure torture um it is uh, i mean yeah there's a straight series of songs on the back half of this record that are called befriend a child killer pressure torture macerate and petrify and of course the closing track all the children are dead um <laughs> So yeah, it's a, it's a really, it's a really fun record. Um, it's a lot of um, fun in the sense that if you're really into break, <laughs> break core, it's really entertaining. It's a wild ride. Um, t- takes you through the extremes of that sound. Um, it's that definitely. Album cover is a. Yeah, it's, uh... it's definitely, um, you know, it's definitely not terribly representative of venetian snares music like it's a very kind of extreme variant of what of what aaron funk does but that's his real name by the way aaron funk um, i was about to ask but um but yeah if, if that kind of concept and that kind of like extremity like if you're interested in like you know noise artists like uh white house or whatever then check that out you'll definitely find it an interesting experience and i'm glad that i listened to it but i'm looking forward to listening to some venetian snares records that aren't about murdering children <laughs> Yeah, yeah, um, like his one about being a, hoping they a have Nazi those. on the guard tower of the concentration camps. Can't wait for that one. Yeah, if you're ever I, listen- I don't know what's more disturbing, that or the fact that I don't know if August is making that up. <laughs> I'm sure he's not. If you're keen to listen to Venetian Sneers, I highly recommend the Chocolate Wheelchair album, which is pure breakcore fun and it ends with a song called herbie goes ballistic which features samples from the love bug that are cut up to suggest that herbie is murdering several people um it's a great album anyway what else have i been listening to uh <laughs> venetian snares man so much fun 
I, I listened to uh, the Jimmy Heat World's debut album, Static Prevails, uh, which I thought was really good. I didn't quite enjoy it as much as I was hoping to. I, I, it definitely represents a kind of more primitive version of this sound. Like the kind of emo roots that they're based in are much more kind of prevalent here as they are on Clarity. Um, but Clarity, when you've already heard Clarity, it very much sort of feels like a dry run warm up for a record like Clarity. And it doesn't really reach the heights that that album reaches very frequently. But if you're into Jimmy Eat World, it's still pretty good. Um, so yeah, I enjoyed that. I listened to uh, the Eve's Tumors new EP, The Asymptotical mm. World, which I really enjoyed, um, especially the first two tracks. Really funky, really um, First catchy. track is one of the best thing they've ever made. Yep, absolutely. Uh, one of the best songs of the year. I'd wait, one of the best singles of the year. I'd wager Jackie, great song. Um, I think I liked the second song even narrowly better, but I forgot what it's called. Anyway, really good EP, very short. So I recommend checking that out if you're curious. I also listened to um, Long Overdue, honestly, considering that I knew several tracks on it already. But I listened to Rage Against the Machine's Evil Empire album, um, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Um, the thing about Rage Against the Machine is that their out first album is like, hundred percent great songs like there's not a single song on their first album that isn't amazing it's a really immaculate and tight record and evil empire somehow is almost as good as that like it's an incredible standard that the band set for themselves with their debut and then evil empire just barrel rolls right through and is almost as good honestly obviously i'm very warmly familiar with um, two of the biggest songs on this record bulls on parade and down rodeo both of which i would say are the two best songs on the album but that's not to say the rest of the record is lacking in showstoppers vietnam revolver uh, wind below people of the sun are all fantastic songs yeah, amazing record that you didn't need me to tell you that it was amazing, but it was a pleasant surprise that I ended up enjoying it as much as I did because I had a high standard after that first album of theirs. And uh, last thing I'll shout out as well is that this week we were heartbroken to lose Joey Jordison, the drummer of Slipknot, uh, a really yeah. devastating loss. Um, he was not, he was in his 40s, I think, which is just. 46, 46 gone yeah. way too soon so that and i was already kind of i watched the the hbo documentary woodstock 99 uh which i incidentally got into because stephen hyden produced it um and it's a yeah. it's a really fascinating documentary about one of the most disastrous music festivals of all time um it makes fire festival look like a joke frankly because yeah. fire oh, festival no because fire festival is more of a case of like you know uh, underwhelming expectations and this thing that didn't deliver whereas Woodstock 99 is about this and so sure I saw that you watched it this week as well so you'll know exactly what what it was like um this kind of difficult to describe I really recommend watching the documentary it's very entertaining uh and dark as well it, it a lot went wrong let's say and and a, and a lot of it can be attributed to Fred Durst uh, <laughs> naturally <laughs> as most things that bad things can fred, be fred durst did 9 11 yeah what we're there's, saying. there's a great moment towards the end of the documentary where everything is kind of just going as wrong as you possibly think it could go um like this fucking gigantic stand is on fire and like it's just <laughs> massive huge thing is just burning up and red hot chili peppers are playing and the dude who um is kind of running the concert like brings um what's his fucking name aside uh the front man of, of yeah anthony kias brings him aside says hey you need to like say something you need to stop these guys and what they do is they go out and they play a cover of Jimi hendrix's fire yeah um, <laughs> that's <laughs> fucking based which is um <laughs> that it was just a one moment there are millions of moments of just absolute what the fuckness like that in that documentary yeah. um so i recommend it but anyway so i was on a new metal kick and then well not a new metal kick but that, that invigorated my my curiosity to really dig into the music of that era because a lot of the music that you hear and the bands you hear and and with 99 are new metal bands and then Joey Jordison died. And so it was like a confluence of things that convinced me I need to finally listen to Slipknot. And so I did. I put this first Slipknot album on and it's fucking goes. It, it, it's fucking mm -hmm. heat. 
It's mm -hmm. heat. It is. I enjoyed it so much more than I was expecting to, frankly. Um, and I am absolutely going to be listening to most of, if not all of the rest of their records, frankly, because I seem to have I feel a like you're really going to fuck with their most recent because it's such a weird fucking album, but it's yeah. also just fucking hard. Yeah. So yeah, I'm anxious be, to see. I will be. We will be streaming. Um, but no incredible album opens with a run of songs that are just fucking flawless from sick right through to surfacing but particularly the single uh wait and bleed which is just an uh, absolutely amazing Ooh. song um two and a half minutes and it doesn't waste a single second the energy it's they're not at all remotely similar bands but the energy of the song and the hookiness reminded me of dillinger escape plan at their best as well um in spirit anyway <laughs> yeah so i really dug that and that's my week anyway the first album we're going to review today is For those of you who may not know, Darkside are the collaborative duo of producer, musician, soundscape designer, Nicholas Jar, my probably my personal favorite living producer of electronic music outside of, you know, duos and groups, most of whom do not need to be named. But yeah, Nicholas Jar, and in collaboration with the rhythm and funk guitarist Dave Harrington, um, they released a seminal record in 2013 called Psychic that Jake alluded to at the very top of this episode that is very, very good. Um, and if the confluence of sounds that are present on Spiral appeal to you, then you'll love Psychic. It's, it's very much a similar record. Um, although there are some distinct differences in approach between Psychic and Spiral in terms of how the records are constructed and how they generally, what they do with that general template of, you know, Nick, Nico's um, electronic stuff and Dave's, you know, general guitar wizardry. And so we're going to dig into that today. And I feel it's only appropriate to turn to August at this point, because I know August is a pretty big fan of Dark Side, a pretty big fan of Nicholas Jar as well, and get your perspective on this record and maybe want to touch on some of the additional stuff to do with contextualizing this album. All right. So Spiral is an album that first kind of came about between the two about three years ago when after about a in 2018, after about a four long year hiatus of the two, even like talking to each other or playing with each other, playing together, they were like, hey, let's let's get back together and and make something. And what what resulted were a series of jam sessions kind of built around one central groove, one central rhythm. One, one central idea from Dave Harrington's guitar that was then branched off and expanded upon over the course of the next three years and was refined and pieced together to become this, this latest album using heavy jam band influences, as well as a whole other slew of musical influences and ideas I'm sure we'll touch on in this review, but ultimately from these sessions came Spiral, this, this latest album. And it is something I thought lived up to the hype of, of, of what I was anticipating for this band quite well, because I, I think as, as Tyler has, has touched on, this does take a a different enough approach from their previous album, Psychic, where I don't think comparing this album on the on the merits of that one is necessarily fair to just say, oh, Psychic did this and this and this better, this does this and this and this better, so no. Psychic is kind of more of a record that is oriented around grooves and atmosphere and space. It's a very kind of seductive album that kind of pulls you in and focuses around very consistent sort of rhythms and funk tones and melodic motifs. Uh, so in, in some ways it's quite accessible, but in other ways, structurally, it's very loose. Whereas Spiral is a weird, the, the construction of Spiral is weird because it's essentially a jam record. Like you say, it evolved from jams, but it's much more song oriented, I would say, 
um oh yeah on the whole than psychic was it, it, it's, it's a weird example of a record that where it's very much best enjoyed as this holistic piece yet at the same time it is very meticulously constructed into these very distinct movements um that are very song-like i think um more yeah. so than most of what you got on on psychic um so in, in many ways it feels more sort of cohesive it feels like it has slightly more of its own identity i would say than psychic um which is one one differentiation between the two records another thing i think is is useful to mention is you touched on the recording process how protracted it was uh, the fact that this was recorded years ago one thing that felt interesting to me about the recording process was that it was recorded they rented a house in rural new jersey and during the process of recording one of the things they did commonly or not even the process of recording but the process of trying to figure out what this new album was going to be especially because they understood that with a, having had a hiatus and having both made a lot of music in the interim, there will be a certain level of expectation on any follow-up, um, especially with a record as beloved as Psychic. But the whole process that they of composition they had was, yes, to jam, but specifically to jam outdoors. They often rec- took their gear and they went into nature, into the bushes, into the fields of rural New Jersey, um, and just played and, and tried to soak up the atmosphere of where they were um, and tried to soak up the atmosphere of just being in nature, I guess, of being in this kind of more organic space. And, um, and, and no better is that reflected on the album's uh, promotional cover and artwork, which features the kind of, at this point, what's come to be the shorthand for the band and themselves, that or that reflective orb out in nature. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a striking image, right? And I don't know, I mean, with talking about these kinds of records, you have to be a little, uh, you know, you have to get a little yeah. uh, out there and stuff. You have to be a little bit creative, I guess, with how you talk about it. But when I do listen to this record, I do hear a kind of organic sound in it, like a, even if it's a manufactured organic sound, like a, uh, a sense of space and a sense of uh, almost like landscapes that are being built through the dense layers of, of orchestration instrumentation it's, it's an incredibly intricate album as i think most um yeah. records that nicholas jars involved in are but there's a lot of particular delicacy and care taken to create these quite complex arrangements i would say relative to psychic psychic's a beautifully minimal record that i think is very oriented around simplicity and oriented around just that kind of basic relationship between what nicholas and dave do Whereas on Spiral, it feels like they try, they're a bit more ambitious on this record, I think. These arrangements are busier generally than anything is on Psychic. And there's more going on at any given moment. And there is more of a sense of variation and ebb and flow on this record that I think is... Um, you know, at first can be kind of quite overwhelming, um, especially if you're experience, expecting something quite laid back like Psychic was. But um, the more I listen, the more I've listened to Spiral throughout the week, the more I found it to be this really intoxicating and sort of many layered thing that kind of feels like it's revealing new aspects of itself to me every time I listen to it, like I'm hearing new things in certain songs. Yeah, I, that's been my experience with it anyway. Yeah, I, I would say on your on your point of, of soundscapes, nowhere is that more immediate for me than the track The Lawmaker, which uh even which through I believe is it Nicholas Jar singing on yep. this? Like, Nico yeah, does I, the vocals, yeah, on the whole I album. I thought so. I thought so. But his his singing brings this like whispered hushed tone backed by the do 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 on Dave's guitar mm. and it's conjuring this really this really great setting sun imagery this dirty dusty town like I, I remember having chills down my body listening to this on Lostless today yeah because it's it's, it's such a, a beautiful song yeah it's it's very catchy and and very addictive and again very intoxicating yeah part of the reason the, the hooks are here Really. absolutely it, um, which is is so weird to say about a record with that's so like uh chill and laid back and something you can have on in the background but it is very hooky and very poppy at points and i think that that tightrope walk between those two aspects is done in a way that's very ambitious and unique it's not something i've really 
seen pulled off in this way before. I'm really impressed with that aspect. Yeah, absolutely. And again, that comes back to that ebb and flow nature of the record and why I think it's particularly satisfying to approach this as a kind of like holistic single composition with these distinct sort of movements that complement the ones that surround it and, and provide a sense of variation throughout the runtime of this record so that you're never really staying in a single mode too long. Um, and they're always kind of doing introducing new sounds, textures, um, or doing different things with the textures you've gotten used to in a way that the record feels like it's kind of evolving, moving, changing in real time in front of you. It has a kind of live feel that reflects the jam mentality behind this record, I think. And that's one of the things that's so satisfying about it, especially because the kind of music that Dark Side make, especially with Dave's contributions with regard to the kind of funk aspects, are very akin to the kind of music that you typically get from jam bands, right? That kind of real rhythm oriented stuff that you can kind of just riff on. Um, and so the style of music that they make, uh, matching that to a kind of more jam oriented space and a jam oriented composition and construction is a really smart move, I think, because it creates a new shade to the sound that feels um, original and fresh and organic and natural at the same time. I think what's also so interesting about that natural rhythmness is that they're able to add in clearly synthetic elements like the electronics on here, which are often not the forefront of these songs, more in the background, more a lot, yeah, more minimal techno as we were kind of discussing in the group chat earlier, but. Mm. Uh, and, at, and incorporating that in and keeping that natural sound and even making those feel like just the, the buzzing of, of crickets or some kind of foliage, it feel, it's such a, a really smart way to incorporate it that reminded me in a sense of like Orbital's incorporation of that same kind of nature electronic stuff, I'd say. Yeah, and they, they just do a lot of subtle things on this record, I think, to evoke that natural vibe as well. Like, I think, for instance, of the real kind of like slow sort of tribal drum groove on, uh, which song is it? I'm the Echo, um, which mm. has this kind of real sense of sort of spaciousness to it. And there's just general moments like that throughout the record where you really get a sense of visually and kind of sensorily what they're trying to evoke with the sounds that they're using. And it's it's really just invigorating and and it, it gets under your skin in a way that feels really satisfying it, it, it never kind of just washes over you it's always kind of when you're listening to it it's always kind of you feel like you're involved in it while you're listening to it if that makes any sense and i love what, what the thing that makes the dark side project work is that these two men who do very distinct things, who work with very distinct in instrumentation and who come from very distinct backgrounds have this real perfect synergy. Um, and it's, it's more than just a synergy as well. It's that they complement each other while doing those very distinct things. There's never really a point on the record where I feel that for an extended period of time, um, Dave is taking precedence over Nico or Nico is taking precedence over Dave. They're all kind of in sync and in tune together to the extent that there are points where you can't particularly necessarily tell where every single, whether every single sound is coming from which person. And you can't necessarily tell whether um, a particular sound that Dave's making is being manipulated by Nico or not. They're just so, um, and I'm, I'm sure this is probably all like completely different if you don't really know any of these men's music beforehand. I'm sure it probably just is this singular experience. But even when you do, um, they're so creatively in sync and locked in together that they feel like this single organism throughout the whole record that is really exciting because it is it feels like this single organism and yet it's doing these very distinct things that lock in together in a really interesting and original way yeah yeah and a lot of that is is definitely to do with the broad array of genres this album kind of takes uh, influence from uh, like there's parts and I think a, a fair bit of that is Dave's uh, kind of roots as being a funk guitarist but I Nico also does deserve some credit in his vocal deliveries and styles for really never sticking in one lane either because there's parts of his 
his vocal delivery where I'm definitely getting more of a kind of traditional uh, rock oriented kind of singing and then some parts where it's dipping more into R&B and soul and I think those are fascinating fascinating moments that really even go outside of the lane of what these two are known for absolutely one of the things that really struck me listening to this is how much more of a vocal presence or like just how much more vocally Nico is present than he was on the last Dark Side record like he, his vocals are one of the many textural fixtures of these songs and I could see a critique being levied at them that they're not like you know they don't have a lot of presence or they're you know he mumbles or whatever and I mean I think the point of the vocals is just that they're another instrumental texture like anything else in the mix. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're a part of all of that and they're doing their own sort of thing. They're not something that needs to be kind of like sat down and scrutinized um, or anything. They're just kind of part of the fabric of the soundscape. But I, yeah. I would be curious to hear from, I mean, Jake and Morgan are here, either of you, um, in terms of what you think about the different sounds that are on this record and how they kind of come together and relate and, and what your experience was listening to this record. Personally, the only exposure I've had to Nicholas Jar in the past was, oh uh, God, I, it was one of those albums that came out. It was like a one of his like house projects. Against all uh, logic, that's the one. And I am sort of notoriously just kind of averse to to house inflicted things, and that's the only thing I knew him from. I knew he was a prolific dude. So I was just sort of like, oh, okay, this is a project from him. And I was kind of worried because I was just like, oh boy, fucking another instance of me listening to something and just being like, well, I found the one thing that never works for me. And much to my surprise, this was absolutely fucking nothing like that. Weird uh, twist of opinions with me on the albums that we're reviewing this week. But I definitely, like, I really, really like this. The unfortunate thing about it is, and why I really wasn't like, I, I wanted you all to say your piece was because I can't fucking really explain why the fuck this album works so well. I can definitely tell you that it's not at all what I expected it to be. It's like you use the word organic a lot. And I think that's a like as good as you can get when it comes to the actual raw like sound of it. And that was the thing that I ended up sort of liking the most is the old a lot of, you know, electronic music. It's it has the the result of sounding like a um, artificial or even like kind of cold you know you can put as many warm scents in something as you want but you know it's it's difficult to sort of capture that sort of antithesis to what you like are from the ground up as electronic music kind of operates you know it's made from machines so obviously it's going to be harder to sort of imbue you with that but like the guitar work on here is just fucking outstanding i really like how just you know, this is a fucking awful dis, uh, descriptor for, for any music, but like, God, this album's a vibe. It, it's one of the most like relaxing things I've heard. And I'm really looking forward to the opportunity to use it in a situation where I can actually like put it to use and calm myself down just because like it rides that line of like not being so uneventful or minimal or meditative that it's like uninteresting or thin. I'd say the only point on the album where it actually does do that a little bit is i'm I, I hate to go against it considering this is a track that everybody really dug in the group chat but i'm not super fond of the first half of lawmaker but that second like the way it's built up and becomes way more spacious there in the second half is just fucking great uh that's and, and that's the thing is like that's my least favorite song on the album and i still more or less love like that one particular part of it so there's something to like love here i feel like if this is just even kind of vaguely in your direction of musical interest that will captivate you somehow but like you know in, in terms of how i describe this it's just like you know like the grooves are fun but they're never anything that like take you out of it i really like how playful it is Tri uh, tyler mentioned how tribal the drums felt and i feel like that just really accentuated it it kind of ride the line rides the line emotionally between kind of uneasy and anxious but also super calming uh lyrically i didn't look into it like 
a, a whole bunch just because a lot of the lyrics seem like they're there more for the sake of texture than anything else like you're like the lyrics are, are on there you can look it up if you have apple, apple music it'll tell you but like if you were just listening to it they're they're mixed in a way that they're like they're present in the sound of the song but they're just kind of muffled and you can't really like make them out make them out um, so that part of the album I haven't really gotten into, but it's really just because I'm so focused on how otherworldly it all is. And if you all say that Psychic is a similar, similar album to this, then I genuinely can't wait to check that one out just because mm-hmm. of how much I really like this. It's just unfortunate that I, it, there's just, in, unless you're a Tyler or an August and you've been weaned on Autecker and Brian Eno, I, I feel like you might be a little bit lacking in, in, in specifics or perhaps that's just me being me, but like there's, there's a lot to love here and I do more or less. It, it sounds very spiritual. It sounds like, it almost actually gives me the vibe of like a soundtrack in a way. Um, like I feel like it would be accentuated to like an like an old 70s horror film or something something like really elemental um, but something that undeniably has a bit of an atmosphere to it so like if you know if you're not exactly like I'm sure if you're into electronic music you know about this album just because it's like you know important dark side but like Mm -hmm. even if you don't give it a whirl it's nothing like I expected it to be and it really caught me off guard with how much I liked it yeah one thing I I loved that it's not even about this album but when i think i brought up dark side a few days ago in one of our group chats and our friend zach said that the um the psychic album the first dark side album at many points reminded him of like the cliff martinez and chromatics score for drive Ooh. from nick uh, Riffin. Right. and that aspect of kind of like just really minimal kind of funky stuff um that just is really textural and really sets a groundwork is, is definitely a thing that's present in the music that Dave and Nico make together and what's exciting about Spiral for me is that that's still intact but there's so much else happening on this album like it's like every time I listen to it like I said there's like different sounds or like little motifs and stuff that I pick up on that I didn't really catch on to the first time there's a lot happening on this album which is funny for a minimal techno-esque record, right? Like there's, and I think that might be part of the reason why Jake Black is listening is required, really. Yeah, and I think it might be part of the reason, Jake, why you weren't turned off by this record like you are by other records that are kind of minimal techno y housey stuff because there's just so much happening and it's always so grounded and, and moving forward. Yeah. Uh, it's never really staying in the same place for very long. And even when you have these reliable textures like Nico's synths and and percussion especially and um dave's guitar licks and stuff the textures on those are always being changed as well between tracks so you never really hear dave doing the same kind of lick on more than one track he's always kind of like doing something a bit different and modulating and stuff so the album never really stays in the same place which i think is is to its great credit and strength yeah it's a lot more textured and less i guess i expected it to be like dry in a way because that's just a lot of how i processed other types of music that nick makes but i mean i i definitely get the hype here this is this is totally and i feel like i'm still sort of like in terms of this kind of music i'm still kind of a layman so you know if you're more into it there's just so much to appreciate here that i clearly i'm just i can't i guess but like i still be Mm. turning this on and i i do be ascending when fucking i'm the echo and uh inside is out there come on god the fucking final track on this fuck it's really good (laughs) yeah um a couple of things I just want to bring up a few things on certain tracks that I really like specific things and then maybe if anyone wants to add to them they can do that but um, I think Narrow Road the opener on this record is a perfect introduction to the synthesized sounds of these two men like if you've never listened to anything they've done Narrow Road instantly lets you familiarize yourself with these two distinct styles with the synthesized sounds of these two men with Nico's very atmospheric and production heavy attitude to percussion and electronic sounds and Dave's absolutely shredding guitar playing which at at many moments on this record is absolutely kind of breathtaking Um, there's almost a bluesy feel that it has in this opening track that I really like and then it goes into The Limit Um, the opening seconds of The Limit also almost remind me of something Tim Hecker would compose Um, and then but until the beat kicks in 
as alongside Nico's vocal and it just becomes something throttling, hefty, even funky, um, which obviously we've already talked about that funk influence on Dave's playing, um, which is great, but he also knows how to deconstruct that to its barest elements and then selectively employ those elements in his playing in a way that hooks you without ever feeling like he's showboating as a guitarist. Like Dave is an incredibly talented and well-regarded guitarist among guitar nerds. Um, from what I can gather and yet he's such a unshowy and subtle player that he doesn't necessarily get as much attention because he's not you know going ham all the time Um, but I mean that's what makes it so rewarding right he always knows how to give you just enough to fill the pocket and then Nico comes in and adds um, you know fleshes it all out and together they work like architects building these kind of big three-dimensional landscapes that layer on top of each other and that's another thing that i think is really underappreciated about nicholas jar's solo work as well is just how much care he puts into album construction um it's if, if you're a nerd for that kind of thing then the records of dark side are very satisfying um, I, I also love the gentle construction of a track like The Question Is To See It All. Um, really intricate, unshowy, subtle, not one of the hookier tracks on the record. But once you kind of listen to it and sit down and kind of try and describe it while you're listening to it, you realize how much is going on. There are these great acoustic guitar passages in this song that are, again, this new element that adds so much color, um, gently arpeggiating tones, vocal loops that are used in a really kind of dreamy way. It's very formally unconventional too, which I guess sets up the relative conventionality of Lawmaker really well, which again, we've talked about that groove on that track is so just tight. Dave has some really disgusting, noisy guitar parts that filter into parts of that song too as well that just give you a little bit of a fucking shock to the system. Um, It's great how he can go from making his guitar sound really warm and velvety in one moment to sounding like a literal fucking electric shock to the brain in the next moment. It's really, really um, awesome stuff. I like the way that I'm the Echo uh, almost serves like a counterpoint to Lawmaker, except it's like a more expansive and spacious one because these two songs are just seamlessly flow into each other. Um, That tribal groove I mentioned in this song is great and yeah it's just a really awesome groove then you have the album's lead single liberty bell which again you've had all this funk stuff throughout the record and then with liberty bell nico gives you a piece of straight house music minimal house music Uh, and it's really intoxicating the loops on this track are really really satisfying the deep basses sets a great sort of atmospheric tone the mixture of both club beats and live drumming is just stellar uh, and then Nico's vocals, I feel like the cherry on top of this whole thing. Um, they're just so well suited to the atmosphere that's being set. And they just add this extra bit of pizzazz to the song that um, I'm not surprised they chose it for the lead single. I am fucking in love with the rich piano chords and percussive textures of the album's longest track, Inside Is Out There, uh, which is actually my favorite song on the album. Uh, It pulls you into, I think, one of the most sublime compositions the band have ever created. Um, I think the interlocking and wrapping together of Dave and Nico as individual musicians is as seamless here as it ever has been. And then you just have so, so many surprises, like those rich piano chords are so, oh, they're so just fucking tasty. And then you have these horns and reeds that weave their way through the song as it progresses to the point where it almost kind of deconstructs till you're left with these really sharp hi-hats. They're just kind of like really insistently going and they're tight as hell. There's no reverb whatsoever. They're just really fucking tight. And the jam is kind of like by the end of this track, this eight minute piece, it's this pool of sounds that are led by those hi-hats and it's just fucking kino. And then Only Young is this really bluesy closure that calls back to the feel of the album opener. has a great swing to it. Nico gives some great vocal runs on this track. Again, you have some of the most blitzing guitar soloing from Dave as well. Um, That is, and and like the absolute pinnacle, basically, of, of what these two men have been able to do together. And... Yeah, and that's that's the album for me, really. It's it's this absolute delectable treat that almost feels like I, I can't listen to it too often. Like I need to take breaks in between listening to it because it like is giving me so much. 
and it's like a rich cake in some ways if that makes any sense um but yeah i, I absolutely am, am currently addicted and i have had this album going at least once a day every day since it came out i'm pretty similar to jake's perspective of i really like this but it's also so detailed and expansive that since we don't have time to sit here and go through this album like minute by minute to analyze what's going on i have to just kind of go it's just great it's really vibey it's really jammy another frustrating thing about it is that like it's so consistent throughout the entire thing but it's also so consistently like eight out of ten like just (laughs) never quite being like a masterful track except i would say narrow road uh, i think that song's pretty much perfect which is is, is li- it also leaves you in a strange space of having to say something substantial uh because everything's so like just not quite a thousand percent your speed and it's hard to articulate why because so much of it is in so many ways yeah i i liked it i was just downstairs explaining to my family just got home like what the album is like genre tone wise like where the two different people who made it are coming from and they could not imagine it working but it it does um and in a way it works because uh it works so well because it's such um unique aesthetic for an album you know um it's sonically I, I do agree with Morgan that there isn't like a point on the record where i feel like it's just really clicking and like the gears of the record are slotting in with the gears of my body for a really tortured metaphor but it is consistently really interesting and i want to just like like a, a fungus expand through the careers of both of these gentlemen i guess Uh, and I have spoken very positively of this record so far. I do have some issues with it, Uh, namely in that I think the constantly moving, shifting nature of it, where it never quite settles down, while I think that's a good aspect and adds to a lot of, leads to a lot of really interesting sonic progressions, I do feel there are points on the record where it does leave these song, a couple of these songs in a tough place when they have to come to a close. Sometimes the, the ending couple, uh, 30 seconds of a song can feel a little awkward for me in trying to close out themselves and create a bridge to the next one. Sometimes that wasn't quite executed as well as it possibly could have been in my opinion, but that aside, I, I'm kind of with everyone here. This is a uh, really great album. Yeah, I would definitely encourage, even if you didn't love this album as much as you maybe hoped you would, I would still definitely encourage listening to Psychic because um, I, I still probably, I I don't really have any major reservations about this record at all. And yet I think probably Psychic is even better um, still. So um, that that's just one of those records that because of the way that it is, nothing else that existed before it sounded anything like it like it was a completely original musical idea when in in terms of execution and combination when it happened Mm -hmm. and so i guess spiral if it suffers from anything is the fact that it's no longer a completely original musical idea or it has a precedent now and it's the previous and they do a great job of trying to you know wrinkle it and do something different with that aesthetic but at the heart of it it's something that will never be as groundbreaking as it was on that first record and uh, but i appreciate nick nico and dave doing as much as they can to you know find new avenues for it but that Again, Psychic is just one of those albums where it comes out and it's elementally simple and yet no one's ever done anything like it until that point. One, one more recommendation to throw in there. Promise I'm done after this. But uh, if, if you did enjoy this record, but you wanted something a little more on the, the minimal side, like maybe that's what you were expecting, as Tyler mentioned earlier, I would recommend uh, Nicholas Jar's album Senizaz from last year, which keeps the vocals 
keeps the minimal electronic stuff, but ditches a lot of the louder, heavier guitar parts because mm-hmm. Dave's not on that album. So if if that's kind of maybe something that was a deterrent for you here, maybe that's something you can try out to still get an appreciation for what these men do. Totally. Nico's solo work, I mean, credit to him. There's a lot of variation within his solo albums. He never mm. really makes the same record once. Probably the closest thing to this in his discography is his record Sirens from 2016, which also has a lot of sort of guitar interpretations and stuff in it. But I mean, you could just, you know, throw a dart at the map with his discography and find a banger. Yeah. Which I think is a nice little note to lead us out on. Favorite tracks yeah. and ratings for Spiral from Dark Side. Jake, why don't you lead us off? My three favorite tracks are Narrow Road, Inside is Out There, and Only Young. Least favorite track is Lawmaker. I give the album a tentative 7.5. All right. Um, my three favorite tracks would have to be, I'd say, I'd say, yeah, Narrow Road, uh, Liberty Bell, and probably Lawmaker, my least favorite. And, and it's, it's a tough one to decide on least favorite because these are all quite fairly consistent but i would say maybe the limit i would give this a 7.5 out of 10 narrow road inside is out there and liberty bell don't really have a least favorite uh eight out of ten neato um so my favorite tracks are the limit um lawmaker and insiders out there um i don't really want to pick her least favorite tracks they're all they're all good um and i'm gonna give this like a seven and a half out of ten okay um yeah picking f- favorite tracks again it's a record of distinct movements but every time i experience it it really just feels like spiral is the thing um it just is this one big piece but i guess if i had to pick movements that i particularly love I would say, yeah, Narrow Road, Lawmaker, and Insiders out there. Again, I don't really think there's any real weakness on this record, but I've had to pick a least favorite. I'd probably say the title track, maybe, um, doesn't leave as much of an impression. Um, And I'm giving this an 8.5. Cool, cool, cool. Um, So the standard deviation is incredibly small, as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, It's 0.4, and it's an average rating of 7.8 which uh, is equivalent to uh, White Crosses, Board of Villain, God Has Nothing to Do With It, Leave Him Out of It, Fahisu, among others. Oh, LP5 is a great comparison point. Awesome. So, yeah, let us know in the comments below what you think of this record, um, and we'll move swiftly along to our second review of the day, which is... Alexis Marshall is the frontman of Daughters, the legendary modern noise rock band. Um, and this is kind of a bit of a long-awaited sort of release. Alexis has spoken about want, not, what, not wanting to lean too heavily on Daughters as, as his sole musical outlet. And the desire to express himself through his own soul and music has been a long time coming. I think he's dropped some singles, loose tracks that didn't make it onto this record, I think came out last year. And then this whole thing sort of started coming together and now we have this new record, which I think is an interesting record. And I think shows an interesting development of interests. It's a lot of interest for uh, Alexis in terms of his style, even if it doesn't quite hit the highs of the, the music with daughters, particularly their more recent records. So I think for, for starters, the booming discordant piano chords that open the record up with opener drink from the oceans set an immediate tone. Uh, immediately, the music on this record is much more sparse than any of Alexis's work with Daughters, more focused on texture than composition, which might sound like a slight, um, but isn't really on this track. It's just a different kind of world that it sets you into that requires its own mindset. Instead of being brutally pummeled by the music, 
you are suspended in a state of tense unrelease, I guess, which from what I can gather from the things that Alexis has said, this state that the album puts you in, that state of suspended tension, is very much his way of kind of encapsulating the way he exists and basically the constant state uh, of his brain and of living and versus the you know absolutely clattering violence of the music he makes with daughters the they exist at these two sorts of different poles of expression of these darker sides of humanity and of these dark emotions hounds in the abyss the second track i think has some great textural intensity to it i like the way it builds around really distorted laying layering percussion it's very disorienting that's one way i would describe this record it's disorienting uh, Alexis intones with a kind of tired desperation that sounds pained on this song. Uh, it's a particular vocal style that you can hear him use in a number of daughter songs, um, but I think it sounds particularly haunted and uncomfortable here, especially when this is a song, the lead single for this record has no melody, um, just this monotonous modulating repetition. And the thing about this record, and I'm sure you'll all have thoughts on this is that style that whole approach of um, that monotonous modulating repetition as a way of suspending you in this state of tension it it works better in some instances than it does in other instances and there's a limitation to it that i don't quite think that alexis fully overcomes but that said the when it works like it does on the first couple tracks of this record it really has this chilling effect um, especially when you have the the vocals and the lyrics that alexis is going into that sound really uh paranoid and uh upsetting and and has the same sense of kind of doom that a lot of daughters lyrics on their last record have that sense of just this impending inevitable horrific thing that is going to happen the state of existing in a living nightmare um that aspect of the record i find uh, really compelling when it is done uh, when he really focuses in on putting you in that state of mind um so that is i think the record's greatest strength but certainly it has some limitations as well and i know that um you know most of us are probably quite keenly aware of them so i have some other things to say about this record but i'll sort of stop there and sort of step back and um just i guess ask if anyone wants to sort of build on what i've been saying well uh i don't i'll i'll say this much i don't dislike this album that said easily the front runner for the most disappointed of an al- uh, an experience I've had with an album this year. I mean, even with stuff like Steven Wilson, I knew that album was going to be rocky going into it. I didn't have expectations for it, but I feel like this really sucker punched me in a way that I didn't particularly care for because it's like, I hear, you know, Oh, front man from daughters. Okay. This is something I'm interested in. I love the most recent two daughters records. I like, like love, love them. And so like, yeah, cool. And then a few weeks ago that, you know, they had a single drop, which is Hounds in the Abyss, which uh, Tyler spoke a little bit about, which I think is pretty head and shoulders, the best song on here. Um, I really, really like this track. I really, really like what it's going for. I think it achieves all of the, um, its goals in terms of tension and minimalism and just the stark bleakness. And even the opening track, Drink from the Oceans, is also, I think, it's a really good way to achieve that. And even putting these two together, which are tracks that largely have the same effect, they just have really, really different structures, really, really works. And then the album just fucking falls right on its face afterwards. Um, not that it just doesn't feel good anymore as a bad song. It's, like, fine. It's, it's, it's just a little bit, like, the repetition is, like, doesn't work for me starting here. But, like, the core of the song is still good enough. And then the ones who punch of youth is religion and religion is leader just fucking lose me. Both of these tracks are just a, an absolute snore. I couldn't like, I, I can't identify a single thing about them where I was just like, oh, this is achieving a uh, something in me. There's like 
there's like a desire to make this more like of a spoken word album uh, throughout the progression of it, which is not like, you know, not outside this dude's wheelhouse. A lot of his delivery on the last daughter's album was kind of like that. And to be fair, I was not expecting an album like that to be this because that last daughter's album was unprecedented. A lot of that, the sonic directions that album went and came with from fucking nowhere. This I kind of expected to be sort of the same kind of thing of just him doing his own thing. And for the large part, it is. It's just that none of it really manages to to rise above mediocre for me like the, i i feel like the intent here is to make something like spiderland i feel like the that sort of darkness uh via instrumentation and spoken word lyrics is just you know it, it's a very similar wheelhouse and the problem with that is is that spiderland is really instrumentally compelling and this isn't like the minimalism just for me it takes a such a harsh dive once you get to that youth is religion and then no truth in the body is like fine but like it, it's just it's kind of buried in this mix that just I, I really don't care for but it's only on this specific song and then there's open mouth which is just like okay man sure whatever and then the last two songs are like fine. And, you know, I, I don't even know whether or not I'm coming off more positive or negative than my overall opinion on the album is. It's just that literally my experience with it on the first time was like, okay, this was a little weird and wonky. Maybe if I listen to it a little bit more, I'll, I'll like get it. And it just comes to the point where it's like, I really like the first two tracks. The third track is pretty good. And then the rest of the album becomes white noise. And I'm just like, well, that fucking man, come on add a little definition to your songs add a bit more like just because you have minimalism doesn't mean like it has to be like desolate which this feels like and i'm just like oh it might be the point and it's like well it, it feels desolate by virtue of the fact that nothing's happening and i wish i was listening to something else so like i wouldn't say it's bad but i also can't give you a single solitary reason why i would recommend it to anybody so like okay yeah i'm, eh. I'm just really glad I'm really glad I'm, because I was really worried I would be alone. Um, and I share so many of your thoughts, but I think I just come down slightly harsher in my final verdict. Oh, man. Uh, where I just, I feel like it opens with a lot of potential, but by the end of the record, I feel like I just have no use in my life for this album. Like, I don't know in which context I would listen to it, you know? You, um, you, you have a great point. I don't really think I have a use for it either. Yeah, I just, I got, like, I didn't actually know Alexis Moss, uh, the, 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 the person behind this album was in Daughters, and I guess within a minute of the first song. Um, oh, I mean, has, vocal delivery is unmistakable. I know, this is great. Um, and, he, and he is ever a compelling presence, and boy, are there really interesting ideas on the album. I just, uh, I don't know what, what place it has in my music listening life. Yeah, it's obvious. It's boring as shit. Um, <laughs> and I, I Thank wish you for I being Frank something... Morgan. I didn't want to dance around it, but no, no I just I, I wish I wish to God I had something to say that wasn't Frank because I can't remember anything about this. And I don't want to dogpile this album, although that's what we're doing, because in part kind of deserves it. But I, I like this dude. I like where his head's at. I like the approach that this album takes in so yeah, many ways. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's like, it sounds like an album full of moments that are giving you space to breathe and nothing else. <laughs> yeah. Like, there there yeah. are oftentimes moment, uh, moments on albums where things will slow down and you're like, oh, this is more uh, contemplative and I can sort of process what's been going on in the, in the album thus far. And then this is just nothing but that and it's a little infuriating and yeah I, I, yeah, yeah. I, I almost feel like it's the opposite side to the debut daughter's record the opposite side of that coin um in the yeah. plenty of interesting stuff but that's a way more aggressive version of it um but it's just there's so much like a tonal noise and I can get behind that, but it's like, I don't, I can't find like a way into it. 
we talk about where whether this record kind of works for us or fits our own sort of niche, which is very valid. But I mean, we. So I still think there's plenty, even even accepting the fact that we're not into the album, there's still, I think, plenty to talk about in terms of what it's actually trying to do and what it's actually about and some of the themes of the record and some of the ideas. But what if I can't remember any of them? Well, th- th- that's the problem, though, is that it feels like ba- it feels like ground that this band has covered before. So it becomes like even if you try and like, you know, you go through and you parse through all of this. I, I still don't really like, you know, all of these, you know, it's supposed to sort of replicate the sort of state that Alexis is in where, you know, he's like, you know, living on the edge, constantly teetering and how this, you know, this anxiety is just like always present and it's overbearing and and all of these things. And it's just like, yeah, sure. But also your music is so lightweight in a sense that it like it is almost impossible for this to register with me, especially because I feel like there's nothing here that's particularly unique for what like it like it might be a little bit more like personal and a little less nebulous than something like you you uh, can't or whatever the fuck that album's called, but like it, it, there's no the the minimalism doesn't yield definition like morgan said it bet like actually morgan and stair should kind of have this point where it's like oh you have that self-titled daughter's record where it's like you if you like meld that and this and smush them together then you get the most recent daughter's album because it's a moment where it's like you know you have like both of the albums that make up this hypothetical math equation in my head are basically in one mode the entire time and they suffer for it because of that and it's just like it doesn't really like there definitely is something to dive into here but I have to question what the, the the use is if, but like me personally, who had this experience with this album, I don't know how to talk about it because it doesn't leave an impression. And when it doesn't leave an impression and the music doesn't match, it's not effective. So like, yeah, I don't I mean, really, I, I'm left in a murky water here. Yeah, yeah, like, that's, that's, that's part of the thing where I can't go too in depth on this because it's like, it feels dishonest in a way because I didn't engage with any of it. I don't remember any of it. So I have to sit here and sort of espouse on the details of why it doesn't work. I'm just sitting here and going, well, you know, the fucking no, part where Morgan, there's just s- stuff here and doing things. And Morgan, like, it's not entertaining. It's not insightful. There are points where I kind of, I can see what it's kind of going for with the really kind of compressed, claustrophobic, tight sounding drums and whatnot. I, I can kind of see how it's trying to evoke this paranoia, this this schizophrenia, but I mean, it falls flat when a guy s- is singing over it with a bad Christopher Walken impressor. And... <laughs> That's a very uh, particular and and w- way that you've just described it that I'm never <laughs> not going to hear from now on. Oh God, I I'm I'm genuinely upset that I didn't think of that because August, I'm like playing the loops of his voice in my head that I remember, and I'm like, oh my God, he talks exactly like old Christopher Walken talks, where he's just kind of like it's like kind of monotone, but it's just sort of modulates, and so his voice just kind of registers like this, yeah. and it's just. I also think that to to uh, just. To, to enhance pretty much everything that's been said so far. I also think my problem with the lyrics too is that they're too fucking vague. Is that like, yeah, they can evoke some kind of claustrophobia and anxiety and all of this, but I'm just like, there's nothing here that like, there's nothing nightmarish or ghoulish enough to make me feel like, whoa, wow, that's a really arresting image. Like on those first two songs, you kind of have this image of him like wandering around his house. It's like, is that you? And he's like, maybe he's talking to nobody. Maybe he's talking to whoever's there. I don't fucking know. But it's like, that's something. And then the rest of the album is just, you know, and, I just, and it's just like, what? Do, I, I, I'm I, supposed to feel what you're feeling. I Make me most, feel it. 
I think the most effective moment of the album lyrically is actually the third track, which I find to be really kind of like just, it reminds me of Swans actually, the lyrical approach, like early Swans. It's like, you have yeah. obligations. Don't get up. Don't get out. Stay where you are. You are expected to meet your obligations. Don't touch anyone. Yeah. Don't look at anyone. When he goes into that real, just singular, just like that, that mode I think is really like, cause he's really kind of like fiery on the song and it really works there. I think when he really locks into that and it's like, you're really getting a sense of just the fucking weight of oppression, like, and of just like expectation and of, you know, the world you live in where you have certain things you have to do that just fucking destroy you and take everything out of you and sap you of all your energy. And that sense of like the, the constancy of that. Um, I think that's really potent on it. It just doesn't feel good anymore. I, I mostly agree on that one because that is one of the tracks that I said that I liked. And I think it's a two-way street for me because this is one of the album, or this is one of the songs on the album that feels like it actually does have like a coherent point to it is that it still feels a bit repetitive to me but also it's repetitive in a way that really is trying to emphasize it you know go for that claustrophobia and that repetition and just kind of hit you with it kind of like swans but it's like I almost wish that the song were longer so it were better at that. But right now it just kind of feels like one very simple idea for a song that's dragged out to like a really unhealthy medium to the point where it's like, this song either needs to be two minutes shorter or five minutes longer. And then I'm working with something. Instead, yeah. it's just kind of like a half measure. And then the rest of the album is that. Yeah, and I'm sympathetic to that as well, because I have a sort of similar issue where it's like a really sort of coherent, clear idea that feels like it fizzles a little bit. I want to shout out as well, because I actually think that in a lot of places, Alexis's lyricism on this record is really great. Um, i particularly enamored with the line on um, They Can Lie There Forever, the opening line of the song, which is, if you were a knife, I would trace the carry away of my vein with your teeth, which is a great line. Um, if yeah. touch were a wreck, I would hold you in my seat. Um, just really fantastic individual lines that he has, individual images. And then he has this other mode where he sort of sit, sit, settles into this thing where it's like, you know, dare in the headlights, dare in the headlights. This iterative repetitions over and over of these singular images, which I think individually can be quite powerful. But there are also issues with regard to the lyrical approach of this record almost sometimes feeling like it's at odds with what's happening musically as well. A lot of the time it's difficult to take in what Alexis is doing lyrically because of the way the songs are set up and constructed, um, which is a shame because I think that he, I mean, to me, he has a lot of the same strength in terms of conjuring this very doom laden feeling with the things he says and the way he says them that he does on the best daughters records. I think that, you know, as we've, iterated that's especially true on those first two tracks as well um but then i think uh, and i mean i have to completely uh, agree with the sentiment that as the record goes on not only does it sort of stasis start to hobble it but certain aspects of the production start to really great as well um and i think so to a certain extent, it has to be acknowledged the creativity of a lot of the construction of some of these songs. Like I read an interview with Alexis where he talks about a lot of the he was how he was very inspired by artists like Tom Waits and stuff in terms of like incorporating really strange non-musical items to create music, like you know bones and stuff, and like doing all kinds of like bringing just fi finding. Um, random things in his shed and then bringing them into the studio and banging them and creating them creating this really kind of eclectic and unnatural sounding percussive mix and the unnatural sound of the percussion of this record the fact you can tell that it's mostly not actual drums but just you know metallic things being banged together I think is a, is a cool approach and works in concept and in works in execution in some places but then it starts to be really hobbled by the production of this record um, and that is where I turn to the dreaded d word which is distortion which um, is layered Boy, into a lot of these songs sometimes works I would say about 20 percent of the time the distortion enhances these songs but most, yeah. of, most of the time, it does not do that. And I believe 100% that it's intentional. And for all of those sort of feelings that we've talked about in terms of, you know, the claustrophobia and all that shit, 
But um, again, there are certain points where it starts to become so unpleasant of a listening experience that isn't in a way that is, you know, sonically interesting in terms of unpleasantness, but is just grating that it, you know, as you've all said beautifully, and as I've tried to kind of wrangle out of you, it takes you out of the experience, like it really fucking ruins it. Um, it really makes it difficult to get involved in the album. And I think that's the biggest issue is the album's kind of stubborn refusal to be to really let you in at any point. Um, and it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, there's lots of artists we could think of and we could talk about and we could review right now who do that kind of oppressive thing in a way that's really attractive. And, and, and one of them is daughters. One of them is daughters, exactly. <laughs> but um, the mode here is just not quite refined enough and sometimes doesn't seem to be, sometimes seems to be at odds with itself in terms of the production in relation to the lyrics. Um, and so when I think of a song like Youth is Religion, where you have the distortion applied selectively to the instrumentation, but not the vocals, it almost feels like it's undermining any real sense of immersion in the track. Uh, and it becomes borderline unlistenable. Um, and it, it's like, that's kind of cool, I guess, but it, it's, it's a one trick pony sort of thing. You could do that for a song, right? You can't make an album out of it. It leans really heavily into this tool to the point where the novelty wears off. And all that's left is the grading experience of having to hear these arrangements lathered in distortion. Alexis repeats the spoken poem of that song in Religion is Leader, where his vocal delivery is more aggressive and the arrangement is noisier. It's more akin to a music concrete track than the previous version's kind of piano drawl. The distortion in Religion is Leader, I think, is used a bit better to create actual harsh noise textures in this song that are not a million miles away from like a Purient album. Um, and I think this song is also helped to a certain extent by the fact that you also have the vocals of Lingua Ignota on many tracks on this record in terms of the backing vocals that add a little bit of an extra ethereal character too. But by beyond this point, um, again, that staleness really starts to settle in. It's not that the creativity is lost as much as it's just that the songs are busy in such similar ways that you can't really distinguish them. And that, again, production style that's added and enhanced and really kind of taken overboard on certain moments really just kind of drowns out all of the possible vibrancy or color. And again, maybe that's the point. Maybe it's to make a really gray album. But, you know, we've talked about why that doesn't work here. And, and it's a shame when that, that goal has to come at the expense of really effective and potent musical arrangement. And then you get to the closing track, which is called Night Moving, which is this really drawling monotone piano thing. And it's a cool place to end the record in concept, right? Because you've had so much noise and it's nice to end the record in a quieter place. But it's such a nothing song. It's, it's, it doesn't really have this impact that you would hope that a quieter closer to the record has. And then it does that really cliche thing where you have these distorted tones that just get louder and louder and louder and start to eat the rest of the mix until Alex, Alexis's voice is, voice is swallowed in it. And I kind of, that's a real <sighs> cliche thing, but I'm actually kind of getting sick of in music is that, oh, let's just turn up the distortion. So, and that is, that means it's getting more intense, guys. Ooh. And you should be feeling really unsettled because it's getting more and more distorted. And oh my God, my vocals, which were the main part of the song, they're getting harder to hear. And that means that I'm getting swallowed by this big monster. And it's like, dude. Aren't I so innovative? It's like, dude. Worship me. <laughs> it's like, dude you can do better than this you can do better than this and that's the thing that unfortunately I come i've heard the last two clipping albums and they're <laughs> better than this yeah so i don't i want to i don't want to be nasty about this because i mean I, I i i do definitely feel like i understand what alexis is going for i and maybe even if other people don't i understand why you wouldn't because it's maybe not clearly articulated i think i get what he's going for it's just not quite uh, consistent enough in its execution and it feels like it shows its hand early and then just does that same hand over and over and it's a, it's a real shame I hate when we have to review an album where it's like there's just nothing to say because it recycles ideas we try to avoid reviewing those kinds of albums and so it's a shame that we've had to do this month. 
Yeah, and that's what's really pissing me off as well. Is fact we had we took two weeks off because nothing interesting came out. We came back and now we're fucking here. It's like Jesus Christ. I just want to get. Can we have foxing already? Can we have lingua ignota already? Can we have fucking liars? Already? We got a good streak upcoming of albums there. It's just like <sighs> if if at least one of these aren't interesting to talk, not even good, interesting to talk about, then I'm gonna film myself jumping off of my roof. Yeah, and at then I'll make the a song about it, like views. Alexis. Anyway. I'll go first, reverse order, whatever. My three favorite tracks are the first three. Least favorite track <laughs> is um, the fourth song, I think. Uh, six. Um, so that's me. And my favorite tracks are also the first three, <laughs> I think. Um, my least favorite is probably Religion as Leader, and it's getting um, a four from me. Uh, yeah, favorites, first two. Least favorites, the 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 duology with the religion word in the title that shit sucked um it's four and a half out of ten uh favorites uh chinese satellite uh least favorite <gasps> yes least favorite uh the revenge of dick cheney uh five out of ten <laughs> The revenge <laughs> in question oh. being for the movie Vice. I was going to say the revenge of Dick I, Cheney honestly, is actually about that's... Alexis Marshall being shot by a shotgun by, <laughs> by Dick Cheney. Vice, a movie so bad it get you feeling bad for a war criminal. I, it, it, that, that is as bad a war crime as anything Dick Cheney did. <laughs> what a thing to say. What a thing to say. Well, it's it's, uh, it's hardly the craziest thing we've ever said on this show. No, it's not. So, I mean, we we did end our last podcast episode that was uploaded to this channel with Bush did 9-11. So, I mean, we did. you know. We did. I we wonder did. if anyone will watch that um, and think we're serious. I mean, are we serious? Are we? <laughs> yeah, that's the are thing. We? <laughs> Michael, there are Moore, three Americans here, and I think all of us are just kind of like... <laughs> And it's like it's like all right. I don't I don't think so. But like also, it. But also, the FBI killed MLK. So I mean, like whatever, man. The F the FBI killed John F Kennedy. I, I'm sure. <laughs> look, I'm I'm sure that jet fuel can melt steel beams. I'm sure that can be done. <laughs> grass just... verge, man. No, no look, the guy look, on the grassy all, 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 all I'm saying is, I I have I have. Uh... George's phone number. So if, if we really want, we can find out. August is um, August, of course, as uh, second cousins with the Bush family, as a yeah, uh, podcast that's, lord. That's one. That's one Thanksgiving where your invitation has been rescinded. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and thank God. Yeah, really. Honestly, oh yeah, I should fucking. Oh, who gives a fucking shit? It's the first three songs, five. Really abusing that standard deviation today, huh, guys? That, that's an average yep. of four point nine. <laughs> Jesus! <laughs> oh no! It was brutal. I'm pretty sure <laughs> is four point nine the rating that Pitchfork gave D. Louse in the Comatorium. I think it might be. Oh God! Oh, some shit like that. Uh, yeah. Uh, that's. It's, it's, uh. it's, <laughs> It's not even no, that imagine, stupid. It's just embarrassing. Imagine a single oh, that is human the being. Rating. Yeah. Imagine uh, a single human being, not a collection of people, but one person giving an album a 4.9. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I am uh, John Pitchfork, and I'm giving this I album hate, a 4.9. I hate that I think I know all of the Pitchfork Mars Volta ratings off by heart. I think I know them all. Um, I 4.9, it's definitely 2.0 for Francis the Mute. I remember, yeah, that. yeah, right. I think it's, I want to say 3.5 for Amputexture or something. Oh like that. my god, uh, Bedlam and Goliath, no. I think might be like a 4.3. I'm Jesus. not sure about that one. And I remember Octahedron because it's the highest rating they've ever given them. <laughs> uh, it's like a six fucking Fantano 6. putting 0. that as his highest rated fucking mars volta album other than francis the mute type beat it's a 6.0 for octahedron i'm pretty sure i just, I just wanted that, to, i just wanted to go you, you got them all correct did Damn. you like to try for I scab want... dates i don't think i know <laughs> scab dates 
What's scared? Uh, it's what do I three point five. Ah, oh, same as amputation then. Bugger. And oh, let's see, tremulant is oh, tremulant's the seven point oh. What? The Mars Volta tre- fell off after tremulant. I am. Oh, yeah. The fuck do you even? <laughs> 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 That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my oh. life. We, anyway. we gave this album a four point nine. Can any of you guess the only other album we have at a four point nine? Uh, oh, Lord, deep down, Smith. happy. I have. You forgot that album happened, didn't you? No, no, I didn't. Clue. Um, is it what well, my the dirty nil by Farrah oh. Abraham? Oh, man. oh no. Yeah, um, an album with more ideas than this one. <laughs> oh, shut up! <laughs> I have to say, I, it's really remarkable and not at all surprising, honestly, how mad we get at mid albums. Like, we just get yeah. really, really angry at them, like, angrier than we get at like bad albums sometimes. It's, it's, um, it's a shame, but it's you know, they bought, bought it on themselves. Make better music, simply They'll go first when the rapture comes. So that's our thoughts on these albums. Please let us know in the comments below if you disagree, if you agree, what you think. I know we were very harsh on the Alexis Marshall records. So if you're a fan of that one, let us know why in the comments below. Let us know about Dark Side as well. Check out our other videos that have gone up recently. We have a record club going up in two days on At The Drive-In's Relationship of Command. We have our Radiohead retrospective continuing in four days with In Rainbows. So stick around for those videos. And yeah, August, why don't you lead us out? As always, everyone, rock over London, rock on Chicago, uh, Airbnb, belong anywhere. Dick Cheney does 7-Eleven. <laughs>